my uh, overall interests are really in understanding sort of the cellular basis of how, how communication between neurons, how does it work? And perhaps more interestingly, how this changes, you know, during development, during learning, during memory, and during in anything else where we think that the connections between neurons are actually important. So uh, just as an introduction, I just put a couple of pretty pictures. This one was taken uh, in my lab, and let's see, this one is maybe a little bit brighter. Um, uh, the picture, and then this is actually take, stolen off the web. And if anybody's interested in sort of uh, beautiful ultra-structural microscopy, I encourage you to go to this website at the Dennis Kunkel, um, at actually somewhere in Hawaii. Dennis Kunkel Microscopy has some very beautiful pictures, uh, very aesthetically pleasing. This is, happens to be a picture of an electron micrograph of a synapse. The colors are, of course, artificial because in electron micrograph you only get the contrast. Um, but it's sort of useful in saying there's a presynaptic part with synaptic vesicles which release neurotransmitter which then affect uh, the, the postsynaptic component whether it's a neuron or a muscle. Uh, and we'll, we'll get to that in a second. This, actually, this picture is a coronal section of a brain of an adult mouse where in which a small fraction of the neurons are forced to express a fluorescent protein. This mouse as well as many others were made by Josh Sainz, who's actually a colleague, and I'm not sure if he already spoke to you, or he, he already spoke to you, okay, so. So jo this is actually one of Josh's mice, and um, this, the illustration for, and the, we took the picture in our lab, and the, the, mainly to illustrate the fact that even when only a small fraction, in fact, I would say one to five percent of the neurons are labeled, essentially the entire brain looks fluorescent. So the colors are such that the brighter colors are redder and whiter. So if you look here, maybe in the cortex, so this is sort of the top, uh, somewhere in the sensory motor cortex, uh, all of these bright cells are layer five pyramidal cells. And you know, if you've only highlighted a very small number, but it looks like they're sort of densely packed. And the point is that even when you highlight a small number of neurons, they are already overwhelming. So how do you pick one synapse, one set of neurons, one set of connections within the brain to you know, search for what changes, what is altered during memory? It, it seems a hopeless task, but we all, of course, pursue it, hoping that it is not a hopeless task. So why study synapses? Synapses because, you know, um, we, in, in some sense, we probably know further than the folk wisdom, which is that, you know, when, you, when you, you or I experience something in the real world, the external stimuli come in and, of course, changes something in your brain, and that's, that sort of constitutes memory and, you know, leaving a trace there. And if you are, in some sense, a materialist and believe that something, you know, physical chemical in the brain is really, you know, is a signature of the long-lasting change, the question becomes, what is that change? And the best guess we have so far with a lot of evidence for it is that it's really the way the neurons are connected together. Because the number of neurons per se is actually not changing all that much in, in adulthood, certainly. Of course, we all are acutely aware of the enormous promise and enormous controversy of stem cells. And there's this feeling that, you know, that's actually sort of a normal thing, that lots of cells are being born, that just simply is not true for the brain. There's certainly cells being born, but as a fraction of the number of neurons that are coming into at least most regions we would care for, uh, it still is rather small. So at first blush, just a simplification, you can assume, I think, safely that it's really the way things are connected and perhaps the properties of the neurons themselves that are changing uh, when, when you, yeah. So the change is, of course, most easily seen in the developing brain because, you know, of course, you see a small little baby and it grows up and you know, the whole size changes, so of course, something has to change. But even something more subtle happens, which is that if you look at some tissue sections, this is taken actually from a textbook, and I always have to apologize for not finding the original source of this, because this is taken from a textbook, which then took it from an original source. But the bottom line is that it's tissue of postmodern tissue of human brain, actually, at various different ages. And if you just label a, in a certain number of neurons in a newborn, in, in the cortex now, uh, in one month, six months, and so on, the immediately striking thing, of course, is that the number of neurons, you know, yeah, it's a different tissue, there's a slight variation, but it's not all that different. But what is different, of course, is the complexity of the processes that, you know, here there's like a neuron, it's a sort of dendrites and little pieces there, but the same neuron, you know, not the same neuron, but similar neurons are, of course, very much more elaborate. And keep in mind that each one of these neurons here is receiving in the order of 10 to 50,000 synapses. So each neuron is actually connected to each other by, connected to many other neurons by a large number of synapses, and it in turn sends out connections to a large number of synapses. So the complexity of the sort of dendrites that you see physically here, you should mentally translate into that much complexity in actual connectivity. You know. But here, you know, there's clearly just fewer connections made, right? 
But of course, the thing is that what is not shown further is that if you actually look at the synapse density, it actually drops after a period of time. So there's this idea that initially there's exuberant growth, and in many regions there's actually a period of synapse elimination. And you know, it's, you know, there are lots of ideas of why you know, that, that, that could be and what, what role it serves. But in developing brain, it's kind of easy to see how the connectivity changes. And, but in, if you're interested in understanding how learning modifies, for example, synapses, you basically run into the problem of in this sea of synapses, or in a needle in a haystack kind of a thing, in the sea of synapse, how do you, you know, get this one drop that changed? Where, where do you look for? So how, so the, 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 I keep going on this because that in the end what we all do, the bottom line is that we take much simpler preparations and study synapses for their own right, for their own sake, with the hope that understanding from that will someday we can translate into a real circumstance where here is the whole sequence of events. Something happened. You remembered this thing. That led to the changes in synapses in this particular set of neurons, and that can explain why you remember. So that, that's sort of the goal. But we're now saying, like, we're just going to study synapses for themselves and, and try to understand. So how can synaptic strength, so the other term that I'll probably you know, put in it, it's the many things which really are jargon, but we, by now we use it so many times, it looks like common English, but you know, it's, it's, no, it's still jargon. So how the strength of the synapse controls the, you know, the neural signal propagation. So the idea is that you know that the, in a cartoon way you have a neuron with its dendrites and the axon. So the dendrites in, in a sort of the rule way, there are always exceptions in the, in the rule, the other neurons, axons, come and make synapses onto these dendrites. Each synapse basically injects, you know, so it releases transmitter, creates an electrical potential of a certain you know, transient, you know, it goes up and down in each of the synapses, does this. When on the ongoing activity, this, you can think of this as sort of million flickering points of lights or whatever, then they all create this collective activity which is of course ever changing. And then if the membrane potential of this neuron when sitting at rest, it's getting all this bombardment of synapses. If it reaches a threshold in the simplification, it fires off an action potential or a spike, and that action potential then gets communicated to the next neuron, and the whole cycle sort of follows. So the frequency and the intensity, the sort of how often and how many spikes you get in a neuron, in some sense, is the code for information processing. What do you mean by that? If I look at, if you take the retina, if there's, you know, let's say there are light sensing neurons, if there's very low intensity of light, you get a certain number of spikes in that neuron and it gets communicated to the brain. If the light intensity increases, one way of coding would be the number of spikes that the, the action potential that this neuron fires will you know, continuously increase. So somebody or some neuron, some network sitting in the brain, all it receives are these action potentials from the eyes. It says, oh, there are only a few spikes, it must be dim. There are lots of spikes, it must be bright. So the idea that the frequency and the, the number of spikes that you get from a neuron, in some abstract sense, carries the information through the networks. So that's sort of a, a, sort of a general, I would say, a dogma in the field. So now imagine that you have these synapses. All of these synapses miraculously become weakened a little bit. So how can you get them weakened? You can imagine that certain, all of them lose a, a, some number of their receptors. So their glutamate receptors, uh, so if by some, something happened and all the synapses lose a few glutamate receptors. So when transmitter is released, instead of giving this nice robust potential, it's a little bit lower. Yeah? When does that happen? When, what, when does what happen? When you get this well, that's actually, we don't know. So this, the idea is that we can, we can do the weakening experimentally in tissue, right? Really in the brain, when does it actually happen or what synapses? We have suggestions, but they're not clear. For example, initially, the idea, as I told you, initially this idea that there's an exuberance of certain synapses. So some of these synapses are in some sense inappropriate, right? They're just made. So those synapses that need to be taken away, those will get weakened in this way. And then eventually they'll go away. So that's one idea. So, okay. But the strengthening and weakening of synapses you know, individually or collectively, in almost every theory, whether it's a, in a napkin theory or a serious mathematical theory, that's what we imagine is, is really storage of memory. So like a particular pattern of something happens, by tweaking the synapses this way and that way, you are able to change the circuit properties. And that's so, so sort of the basis of storing the memory, yeah. So in other words, you observed this in the lab, and now you're trying to figure, it out, figure out where it happens to. That's correct. Well, it ha we think it happens in all the synapses. But the idea is that if you remember, let's take a very simple example of you memorize something, like in a, some poem or something, right? S let's say that I, my theory is that so synapses change somewhere. But how many synapses? Of how many neurons? That's what's completely unknown. 
for at least for complicated tasks such as this. For sim more simple things, like the, the things that we like to study for the most part for a simplification is sensory development. Like, you know, how does the circuitry that senses light, again, to take a simple example, how does that develop? Because at, in, at birth, most creatures actually have very poor visual you know, capabilities. And that gets sort of fine-tuned. Some of the fine-tuning has to do with which synapses get strengthened and weakened. That's correct. That's correct. That's correct. Yeah. So, um, and you can have the, the, the thing to remember is also it can be very specific. We actually think among the 10,000 synapses, you can actually you have the ability to change just one if you want to. So, so if you weaken it, I mean the idea. This is just easy to illustrate because now I'm saying that the same if the same pattern of activity comes, but if the synapses are weaker, you may actually never fire because you never cross threshold. So. So the, this just to very cartoonishly illustrate how the strength of the synapse can directly affect what the neuron will, you know, out, as an output, what will it produce. Do you have any, um, any significance to the amount of neurotransmitter as a result of what you just explained? So is, is, there, is there a concentration? Right. So the question is that is, there, is, is the concentration of the neurotransmitter release present, is that something that can be varied, right? Can that be regulated? Is that a significance? We think so again. Experimentally, we can do that, but whether or not in real life, how much does it happen and how much does it happen in a synapse-specific way is unclear. Of course, we all hear about things like serotonin levels are low or dopamine levels are low, but those things are usually talked about as if the brain is a pool of stuff that you can just you know, chemically change overall, which is useful as a first step. But you have to look, look, and ultimately when you come down, there are really circuits underlying. So it's not like the neurons are you know, sitting in a pool of neurotransmitter that goes up and down, right? It's really that the neurotransmitters are being released very specifically at synapses for the most part. So yes, there is evidence that the levels of neurotransmitter can change, but whether that change occurs in a synapse-specific way, whether it occurs doing normal things like learning and memory versus abnormal situations like disease, that is unclear. All of these, in other words, I, I, I think to be fair, I would say we have a huge list of possibilities, but to tie these possibilities to what really happens and how specifically this happens is in some sense really the challenge for, for the for, for neurobiology at the moment. So I think somebody else had a question or no? Okay, so, so again, another cartoon which I took from a review by Mark Baer, uh, um, actually a professor at MIT some years ago, to say that like how can you think of synaptic in you know, a plasticity, the sort of selective strengthening, weakening, it, to, to look at you know, learning and memory. And imagine that you have three neurons in this primitive brain that each of them is supposed to remember, be activated by specific stimuli. A will activate one, B will activate two, and right, this is the purpose of the circuit. So initially, let's say that you just randomly outgrew axons and doing development, you made synapses everywhere. Everybody connects to everybody. But you, you're now teaching it, teaching the network to say, Wait, one should only respond when you have A, and then uh, you know, two should respond only for B, and three should respond only for C. What you can do is, you can basically pair, every time you present one, you can artificially somehow activate one, or let's say that you, know, you, you, you present this one over and over again, A over and over again. If the synapse fires very often, and in some, in some relation to one, which you know, of course remains mysterious at this point, that this synapse now gets strengthened a lot, let's say. So in an activity-dependent way, by some rule, this synapse gets strengthened, this synapse gets strengthened for, the, for number two, and this one. So now, when you can start with this palette of uniform connections, and by strengthening specific synapses by some rules, and we're still understanding the rules, so I'm not saying we know the rules, by some, some sort of rules, you, you can basically come with this situation where A will predominantly activate one, it might activate B and C a little bit, and, and, and so on. So this, again, this is a cartoon, I remember, right? But this is the kind of simple ideas that drive all the more complicated. So if you were you know, mathematically um, you know, savvy, which I'm, I'm not very much, you could actually come up with specific theories of neural networks which take simple rules and produce very complicated behavior. So you can actually convince yourself, in principle, this could happen, right? Because the math, you, know, you have to use more than your intuition when you want to really look at in a big circuits. But for this kind of simple things, you can rely on intuition. So anyway, so that, so the, basically that's the motivation for this thing. 
So we basically turned the problem, at least pe people like me who say, like, look, in order to move forward, you can either say it's just too complex, let's just wait, or we can say let's simplify the problem, try to understand the basic units, and then at some point, hopefully, you can connect up the dots and you know, go one level high. That's the approach I personally like to take, and that's what uh, I'll tell you for the rest of the talk. What does a synapse look like? So first of all, I have to tell you, most of the experiments we do are done in rodents, mice and rats, for many reasons, including historical. Right? I mean, there, there are certain organisms that have just become historically, you know, people picked it, and then lots of studies are done, and they just, you just keep building on it. So ro mouse, mice, as you know, are a very common mammalian genetic model. So you can do a lot of transgenic mice, you can do knockouts, knock in, and you can do lots of interesting things. And, you know, in terms of the genome and the circuitry, there's just enormous similarity to, you know, primates and humans. So we, we hope that, you know, things we learn, at, at least at the level of synapses, will be useful. So, and this is a single neuron, let's say, with, with its dendrites, you know, the basal dendrites, apical dendrites. If you now zoom in with light microscopy, a single neuron, you can see, has many of these little appendages. They're called dendritic spines. And the spatial scale here is that each of these spines are in the order of one micron size. So just to give you a so this might be like, you know, two or three microns between these two. So within a small, this is just one neuron, right? Within a small region of the dendrites of this neuron, you can probably count in the order of 30 synapses right here. Each of these spines is one synapse, postsynaptic side of the thing. So there's just a lot of synapses in these guys. So if you do more serious morphology with electron microscopy, you can take, basically you have to section this tissue, put it in the electron micrograph, get a simple 2D picture, and take many, many, many sections and build up a 3D model based on this enormous number of you know, 2D sections. And then you can do computer reconstruction, and here's a much higher resolution picture. If you just take one such synapse just in cross section, let's say you happen to cut through here, and then there's a presynaptic axon, which is not marked here, it, which is going through here. That's the presynaptic axon, synaptic vesicles, dendritic spine. To give you an idea again, this is probably in the order of one micron, something close to that. So there's a lot of stuff there. This is in, col in primary culture. So a single synapse is nicely highlighted with hardly anything nearby. If you just take real tissue, something like this, in a very, very small volume of the tissue, there would be so many synapses that it would just become difficult to you know, distinguish one and the other. So the machinery, before I go on to some of the studies, I just want to point out the kinds of um, cartoons that effectively parade as knowledge in, the, in this field. So I'm being a little bit cynical. I would include myself in the cynicism. But the idea is that we have, we know a large number of proteins and molecules that are involved in various processes of synapses. So this is a presynaptic terminal. So the, here's, here's a set of vesicles. The question is when an impulse comes down the axon, how does a vesicle release neurotransmitter, right? That actually we know in actually quite a bit of detail. It's actually one of the <coughs> really good success stories in cell bio, in neural cell biology. And th there's all of these uh, molecules, I would say maybe in the order of 100 specific proteins just sitting there at the synapse to do things at the right time in the right place. So the release transmitter, and when you go on the postsynaptic side of things, transmitter is released, and there's another huge mess of proteins which all come together to ensure that you have in a very precise response. Precise, but regulatable. That's the point. The synapse, I would, I would say one of the things that you need to always keep in mind is that synapse is not just a static thing. It's, we, we think almost every synapse can be sort of tweaked back and forth, up and down. So there's certainly a large number of these things. So you need receptors to attach, you know, the ligand attaches to it. The receptor has to do something like open ion channels and allow ions to flow. It has to signal to the cytoskeleton. It has to, you know, maybe turn on some signaling molecules that have to go to the nucleus to tell the nucleus something. So there's a huge amount of sort of cell, you know, cellular information processing going on. But I'm going to ignore all of that. I'm going to describe simple phenomena to you um, because I, in some sense those are the basic things. You want, to, you want to have a cellular phenomenon and you want to understand how that cellular phenomenon works with the underlying molecules. Or if you're interested in circuit phenomena, you describe the phenomena, you want to understand the circuit phenomena with some, some level below it. So the particular three things that I'll just, I, I don't know how many of these I'll actually be able to tell you is very biased because these are the kinds of things that I engage in research in my lab and I thought that maybe that's the best way to tell you because I'll be excited most about it. So um, the, w the first thing we, we study a lot, actually in the past we've studied a lot and we're doing less so, 
is how synaptic vesicles, how they locally get recycled for reuse. This actually is not just some simple you know, housekeeping duty that cell has to go through. It's actually critical for the life. To give you a very vivid example, take the motor neurons, motor neurons that innervate your calf muscle, let's say. So the distance from the cell body to the actual synapse is in the order of one meter, let's say. Right? So these are synapses that are releasing neurotransmitter to con make your muscles contract. So the synapse is a meter away, and it has a certain supply of vesicles to release transmitter. Let's say you're running. Your neurons are firing at 10 hertz. So every 100 milliseconds, an impulse comes, and a vesicle goes. Another 100 milliseconds, another vesicle goes. Let's say there are 200 vesicles at a, at a single synapse. You can do the math and say, like, how quickly you run out of vesicles to release neurotransmitter. So unless you keep up with new vesicles being formed, so that you can continuously keep releasing transmitter, you're going to be paralyzed in no time. It's, I say this one meter because one meter is just such a long distance that you can't rely on traffic from the cell body. You can imagine the cell body is making all these new vesicles that's setting down to the axon, but that's just way too slow to keep up with the, uh, with the supply, with the, the, the demand. So you need to do this local recycling, and hence we, it's important, and the synapses does actually an exquisite job of doing this. And then the second thing that we, uh, we study in the lab is how the synapses can be modified, particularly by just neural activity. And again, this falls in the category of we think, partly on faith, partly on sort of uh, you know, evidence that people have collected, that modifications of the synapse is just some fundamental way in which circuits change. So we turn the problem and say, like, look, we know it's important, so let's study how modification can occur. So we just give various kinds of activity and find out how synapses can change. And then finally, of course, this is in some sense what I guess we always strive to, and finally in my lab we're actually getting to it, other labs do it already, we're getting to it in our lab, is to just really be able to monitor synaptic activity in a real animal, the whole brain, eventually of course the living, you know, un unanesthetized brain, but right now we just look at anesthetized, you know, mouse brain, so looking at synaptic activity in, in the actual brain in vivo. Vesicle recycling, so this is the actually a cluster of vesicles from a, a lamprey, an eel-like creature lamprey. Its reticular spinal axon makes this really beautiful synapses with a cluster of vesicles. And these are fanciful arrows that I've drawn to say, like, look, you know, vesicles are released. Transmitter is, you know, release activates postsynaptic side. These vesicles, the membrane has to be somehow recycled and taken back so that you can make more vesicles here. And then, you know, there's this complicated process of clathrin-mediated endocytosis, which does part of the job. There is another faster pathway, which we know even less about, that seems to, uh, maybe at low demand, you can actually just somehow fuse the vesicle, release transmitter, and immediately take it back uh, right then and there. It has actually a funny name. It's called kiss and run exocytosis, because vesicles just sort of, you know, they, I guess they kiss and then they, and they run. So. so this is sort of the, the cartoon cycle of uh, vesicle uh, recycling that you have vesicles that need to undergo certain reactions so that they can fuse and release transmitter. Then they, they have to be taken up. The things that you can imagine is that they have to be, of course, refilled with transmitter. That's, you know, otherwise they're, they're kind of useless. But then they also have to, of course, be mobilized to the right place to come back. And uh, so I think in this slide, I think that's probably all that I, um, I would really want to tell you. So one way, th so there are many ways to historically, using biochemical and molecular genetic means, people have actually made enormous advances. In fact, without that, we wouldn't know what proteins are involved, like what goes where, and you know, what, what even the, basically the basic you know, components of the vesicles are. But then at some point, you become limited by the fact that you know all these things, but you don't know how they actually work in real time. Because it's, so you have a list of components, it's, it's almost like you have a list of components in a car, but unless you know something about thermodynamics and how the engine actually works, the internal combustion engine works, just knowing all the components may not really be useful. So you want to see it work in real time. You'll say, like, oh, here's some explosion going on, pistons moving, turning the crank. So you want to see sort of the thing in real action, see it in real time. So one of the things that we do in biology, and most of biology, particularly in neurobiology, is to tag the components of the various um, you know, proteins and you know, perhaps lipids too in the future with fluorescent proteins so that you can just watch where they go. Like if a synapse, I told you, a vesicle is released, it, you know, it, some other membrane goes somewhere, it gets recaptured and comes back in. Can you actually see that in, in real time? If you're able to see that, 
then you can basically perturb and make you know, modified proteins. You can do perturbations of uh, diff different kinds and you know, see how things change. So one of the tricks is that you can take this uh, jellyfish green fluorescent protein, which I think many of you would have heard of. It's a, it's a wonderful discovery where the, you, know, you can take this protein, it, you can attach it to any, any other gene. When it, the protein is made, you, you can make it essentially fluorescent. It folds on its own, it has its own chromophore and so on. So people have actually taken time to modify the original GFP to essentially suit individual needs. The need that we are making use of is that you can modify this GFP, mutagenize this GFP, so that it become, its fluorescence become highly pH sensitive. So normally secretory vesicles, whether it's synaptic vesicles or insulin secreting cells, you know, vesicles in beta cells, they're very acidic inside. So you can imagine sticking a GFP to attach to proteins so the GFP is sitting inside the vesicle, and you can make that GFP now uh, non-fluorescent at low pH. And then when the when a vesicle fuses, you're exposed to the neutral pH in the outside of the cell, and now the, vesicle, the protein will become fluorescent. So you can use this reversible change in fluorescence of the protein to decide when exocytosis occurs, because it will increase the fluorescence, and then when the exocytosis is reversed by endo and endocytosis and reacidification, the fluorescence will again go back to resting. So at resting case, no fluorescence. When you release transmitter, when you open up the vesicle, you get intense fluorescence. When you've you know, reversed the process, you lose the fluorescence. And this actually works. So here's an example where we've taken this protein. Yeah. What is the pH in the vesicle is lower? The pH is low. The pH in the vesicle is around 5.5. And outside, of course, it's close to neutral. It's about 7.4 outside. The pH in the vesicle is probably one of the most acidic, other than lysosomes. The pH in secretory vesicles is very low. It's about 5.5. So we've taken this. We've stuck into a neuron. So here is the, the, the experiment is that we grow some neurons from, as it happens, from rat hippocampus in culture. So these guys are growing and making lots of synapses in a dish. You, take, you introduce this gene, this modified gene, into just a few neurons. It, their axons get labeled with this protein. And of course, at rest, most of the proteins inside the vesicles, low pH, hence hardly fluorescent. But there's a certain amount of this protein which get missorted to the surface of the plasma membrane. So you can actually see the axon. So this, this sort of fuzzy stuff is the axon. And these slight bulgings of this individual synaptic terminal termini, which contain maybe 200 vesicles, let's say, on average. If all the protein was inside vesicles, you should see absolutely no fluorescence. The fact that some of them get you know, missorted or they just happen to be on the surface actually helps us go find the axon. If you now stimulate, this is a live preparation, you go and create activity in this by you know, injecting in a current so you can get action potentials. And this is a movie that's color-coded such that when the red dot is going to loop, when you get the red dot is when we stimulate it to create action potentials, which then releases the transmitter. And what happens is in the place of the synapse, they get brighter. Just think of it, this is sped up a little bit, but this is close to real time. So we have synapses, which when you stimulate, are essentially becoming brighter. And by looking at the increase and the decrease in fluorescence, in effect, we are watching in real time the working of the synapse, the release of transmitter, and then, uh, and then the reuptake of the vesicles. So we could do that, and we can actually quantify that. And we've actually done uh, studies looking at the rates at which these things occur, how these things can be regulated during development, for example, and, and so on. But in order to, you know, so to, this is in addition to studying just the vesicle traffic, the idea is that we can also use this probe. Imagine you express this probe in a certain number of neurons in the real brain, in the intact brain. So whenever those neurons are active, of course, they're going to be releasing transmitter. And by measuring fluorescence, we can detect how much activity there is in that neuron. Let's say you're, you're interested in finding out, uh, this is a fantasy now. Let's say you're, you're interested in hypothalamus because you're interested in sort of appetite control or something like that. You want to know when these particular neurons are active. Like, you know, when you give appetitive stimulus, when you're, under, when you're sleeping, when you're whatever, right? But you also imagine that you have a way of looking at fluorescence in these neurons in a living brain, which we're getting there, but we, we can't quite do that. So you express this protein, you can make a mouse, which expresses this protein, and whenever these neurons are active, you actually get a signature because their synapses are going to fire off, increase the fluorescence. So towards the first, you know, this is the very first step towards us, we have made some transgenic mice 
which express this protein. This protein happens to be called synaptofluorin in, uh, in, in, in certain locations in the, in the brain. And this is actually a section of, the, of a mouse brain. It's, it's a huge mush of green because a large number of neurons are expressing this. So just to give you an idea, this is the hippocampus. So these are the CA3. This is actually the dentate gyrus of the campus and then CA3, CA1 of the hippocampus. And if you take a section of, of one of these mice, and the red stain in this case are the nuclei of certain kinds of cells in the hippocampus called CA1 pyramidal neurons. So these are particular neurons in the CA1 region of the hippocampus, just a cell body. And all along here where the dendrites are, there are many, many, many axons coming in and making these synapses. So all of this mush of green is basically lots of synapses being made onto this. Uh, this is a fixed tissue, so there's no you know, signal to be had other than just resting fluorescence. But you can take a living brain slice from one of these mice, and if you fill one neuron with a red dye, so this is the neuron, so this is spatial scale, it's maybe 20 microns here. Um, so the neuron has a red dye, and you can see these little dendritic spines. Each of these are individual you know, synapses. And at rest around there, you basically see a little bit of green. It's very weak. So these synapses are coming in, the, the, you know, they're not very active. If you stimulate now, you know, we're stimulating quite a bit, and you can see this doesn't loop, I guess. You can basically see in this brain slice preparation, like for example, you focus there, when you stimulate, it increases in fluorescence, and then when you stop, it goes back. So again, this is just to illustrate that in a living, you know, this is a little bit more intact tissue than cultures. Because we just take the brain, slice it in a living, in a brain, we keep in a profuse at the right solution. You can take a thin slice of the brain and put it down and actually do microscopy on, the, on that tissue. So this is, this is just to quantify saying that you, know, you can detect the increase in fluorescence. So this fluorescence intensity corresponds to exocytosis of vesicles and the loss of the fluorescence is endocytosis. And um, so there's a huge amount of work going on when people say like there's specific proteins that speed up or slow down endocytosis because you know, the rate at which the vesicles are recaptured is also highly regulated. And there are some candidates which, for example, if you care about you know, human disease, which I guess we all should, there are candidate proteins which, whose mutations lead to uh, you know, sort of rare syndromes in, in human disease. And none of them so far in the endocytosis defect are specifically for, for neurons, because you would imagine if there's something seriously wrong with neurons, that mutation would never survive, right? I mean, you would never live. But there are other things like you know, melanosomes, which give you, you know, skin color and so on, there are defects in that. And so there are syndromes related to, for example, membrane trafficking in skin cells or you know, kidney cells and so on. So you can actually imagine using these techniques to study how those specific mutations cause this defect in NSA. Is it slowing it down? If so, why does it slow down and so on? So I'm actually not even going to go into the specific details of that because I'm completely running out of time. So the synaptic modification is, is an overall question. So this field probably occupies a very large fraction of neuroscientists. So it's not a it's not just in like some obscure little problem. So a huge number of neuroscientists are really interested in how synapses are formed and modified. So we you know, contribute some in a small, uh, a little bit to the knowledge of it in a very specific way. So I'm just going to skip it. So what our, so to just to give a, a general introduction to that. So our general interests in the synaptic modification are, if you take a network of neurons and force it to essentially undergo very drastic changes in activity levels for prolonged periods of times. What kind of changes in synapses do you expect? You would think that that would be the first thing people would study, but it turns out that is actually not as well studied as certain other more subtle forms of synaptic plasticity, which you, know, you have to do much more complicated experiments. So what, what, what does this have to do with anything? You take a network, you, you drastically alter activity for a long time, and changes. The honest answer is, I don't know, but the the, the more scientific answer, perhaps, is that you would, you would imagine the many conditions where there are insults to the brain, right? Whether it's you know, genetic or you know, some trauma or something, there's an acute period where you really insult the circuit and the circuit might shut down. For example, when you have stroke, like a small stroke, yes, the little bit of the tissue dies, but all the tissue around that, actually for a long period of time, is actually quite inactive. These neurons are actually perfectly healthy. They haven't died but they're actually quite inactive for some time. So, but they then, of course, come back over time. But this period of inactivity, let's say the last for days, presumably does something to the circuit, because here's a circuit which is normally active. All of a sudden, you've just taken away all the activity for some time. And we would imagine that something, that, that leads to something. 
So I would like to imagine that our experimental preparation, for example, could mimic such a such an vector. If you take a network that's active, you make it inactive by, by some experimental manipulation and see what happens to it. So we do this right now in dissociated cultures, and we're also beginning to do this in the real animal by sort of depriving you know, experience to a particular sensory system. But in the, in the culture, the idea is that you can do this, and then you can take, let's say there's, in this culture there are two neurons, one here faintly visible, and another one which we've injected a red dye. And this neuron in this case is making a large number of synapses. Each of these green spots is a single synapse made by this neuron onto this, this neuron. Well, because you can see sort of the co-localization of the, the two. So you can then ask that normally this neuron will connect to this neuron on average with certain strength, certain number, certain number of receptors, certain strength of synaptic transmission. When you now deprive this culture of activity, right, you just put some pharmacological agents that block activity, highly artificial, but it's an experimental manipulation. You can come back and ask, what happens to these synapses? I mean, you could be nothing, but it's not the case. It turns out a network that normally is active, if you push it to the extreme and make it very inactive, its synaptic connectivity moves in a direction to try and restore the activity to normalcy. So the synapses are actually becoming stronger and stronger. In the opposite direction, if you make a neuron that's normally active, hyperactive, if you make it effectively epileptic, its synapses now get down-regulated so that you don't have as much sort of recurrent connections between them. So it's as if, you know, the, we, you know we like to call this homeostatic plasticity in analogy with other in a homeostasis and other physiological processes. The idea is that maybe networks like to have a certain amount of activity. There might be a range, it's not just a set point, but if you really move it to the extreme, there are mechanisms which can auto-regulate so that you try to bring it back to some sort of normalcy. So in the analogy that I give you with the stroke, let's say that there's a region of the brain that, that lost its activity because you, know, you had a stroke and you know, lots of tissue died off near it. Let's say normally it gets the input from that tissue that died off. That's why it now is less active. You can imagine that this tissue now, its own connectivity, that because it makes synapses, the neurons make synapses onto themselves locally, those synapses can be strengthened so that they can just have recurrent activity within themselves and not rely on some external activity you know, activating them. So the, which kind of synapses get you know, turned up or down, of course, will have to be figured out in the real tissue. But this experimental preparation allows us to sort of say, Look, you know, there, there might be mechanisms, at least over the time scale of days, which allow a network to sort of auto-regulate itself so it maintains a certain amount of activity. So that's basically that, that part of it, and we, we're actively pursuing that. But the thing that we would like to do is to study synapses, synapses which have a known function, meaning not some random synapse, but synapse which is of uh, you know, known origin. And you want to study that same synapse repeatedly and you induce some you know, you know, training, if you will, teach this circuit something, or allow it to experience something, and see if those synapses change in a predictable way. So the idea is, the overall goal is basically to say, you know, for a particular identified behavior, can you identify synapses which undergo predictable changes, which can explain the, the sort of the behavioral change. So we're starting to work on the olfactory system for many reasons. Uh, most interesting, of course, is because it is interesting and novel in, in some sense. Um, so the, some of you may know that the olfactory system actually has been, uh, uh, it, the understanding of this has undergone an explosion in the last 10 years because of actually some uh, you know, key discoveries for which actually two people got awarded the Nobel Prize last year. So the first thing is that the olfactory, the epi nasal epithelium, which in the, this is sort of the cross-section of a mouse he rat head actually, so this is sort of the the nasal turbinates, though normally the, all the air goes into the lungs, but some of it gets washed over your nasal epithelium so you can actually smell something. And then this is the olfactory bulb and the rest of the brain. The olfactory bulb is quite large in rodents in comparison to the brain. For us, it's, it's actually very small uh, compared to the rest of the brain. The receptor neurons here project their axons to the olfactory bulb, and there's an amazing organization such that all the receptor neurons which express a particular receptor among the thousand or so that they exist. The actual location may be physically dispersed here, but they all converge to one or two, very small number of discrete loci in the bulb. Meaning a spatially spread out organization gets remapped into a very discrete you know, spot in the olfactory bulb. So the idea is that a particular receptor will make it, if, if you express one particular gene in that, receptor gene in that, it will be sensitive to, let's say, a small number of specific odors. 
So all the neurons which will respond to that particular order will now all converge to one, lo one location here. So that's the sort of the logic of this mapping. So there, there's a beautiful topographical map in the olfactory bulb, which we, uh, you know, but th that's the thing that we're actually interested in studying at the synaptic level. So the receptor, the olfactory sensory neurons, which get, you know, odorant binds to them, activates them, they go on, you know, make synapses in this glomerulus, this discrete locus. So the, the olfactory bulb has an interesting circuit, which I, I don't think there's any need to get into right now, but the idea is that these, the first stage of processing here, then very quickly becomes more complicated. There's lateral interactions, everybody sort of talks to other people, and there's lots of synapses within the bulb. So there's complicated processing before that information then gets sent off to the cortex. So, but what, what, we have, what we're doing right now is to study the, this very first synapsis in the top of the brain here. So the idea is that this is as uncomplicated as we can imagine because it is the first synapse that's conveying the information about the olfactory world because the only thing that's before this are the neurons. So the neurons get activated, they make synapses right there. How do you study this? So it turns out that while we were attempting to make a certain kind of transgenic mice, another group made a very interesting mouse where this probe that I told you, this pH-sensitive probe, the synaptoflorin, which reports synaptic activity, they express that in the sensory neurons here. So all of the synapses made here by these sensory olfactory sensory neurons, they're all labeled by this, this synaptic probe, this fluorescent probe. And when you look at the olfactory bulb of such a mouse, um, you know, you open up the skull and you look at it, you see these beautiful green blobs right here. And each of these blobs is the convergence of literally thousands of axons, all making synapses there. So there are basically, in the, this is probably about 50 microns, 100 microns maybe, this is one of the larger ones. In this 100 microns, there is, and I don't, uh, unfortunately I don't have an estimate at the top of my head, but uh, literally millions of synapses there. So this is very large number of synapses there. So what's the bottom line of this? So what we do is we take these, these mice, we, we've built an apparatus which can deliver a large number of orders. Yes? Can you go back to the previous slide? Right? Yeah. That's the theory. Okay. Molecularly, that's true, meaning that every axon that's converging there, at least in adult, expresses that specific one olfactory gene among the thousand. So there are about a thousand genes that code for different receptors, every one that expresses one will converge to a small number of places. So they, they're beginning to be. So, um, it's, so the, thing, the, the complicated thing, of course, is that there are only a thousand receptors, but how many chemicals out in the world do you think a rat can smell? Right? It's mind-bogglingly large is the point, right? Because you can take, like, we can take, you go to a chemistry lab, take just about any chemical, you can smell it. So any structure that has a little benzene here, a little you know, hydrocarbon here, it's going to smell like something. So the mapping of a receptor to the actual chemical structure is, is, is the unbelievable problem and that I think people would like to understand that. So, so in other words, another way of saying it is the space of odorants is unknowable. It's, we don't know how complex that is. Because if it's just anything that's possible, that's infinite. But probably not anything is possible, so we just don't know how large. Like for a rat, how many odors in the world is, is important? It may be only 15 because all it cares about are 15 things, but we don't know. So that we don't know. So, so in fact, you touched upon a point, which is that what I'm going to describe is that we'll do experiment, we do experiments by just taking monomolecular odors. We just order from sigma catalog, you know, some particular aldehyde, you know, ketone. We just like put single molecules, just add them all in different concentration and or not add them all. So each one, we just like deliver to the, to the nose of the mouse. So, and we don't know, of course, like how many of these things does the mouse really care for, and that, that we, we, we don't know. So, so with the idea is that we, by giving this large order set, we hope to learn some principles which can then be relevant to the real things that the mouse perhaps cares for in the, in the future. So, this is, just a, this is just an order apparatus where we can, you know, have an automatic thing where you can fill this in a like hundred tubes with different orders, and by using solenoid valves and a computer control, we can just expose you know, you know, briefly or however length you want, specific orders. And we also have a, a camera system with the fluorescence, you know, fluorescence you know, um, lamp, which can allow us to look into the brain of these mice. So if, if you look at one of these, so this is now an anesthetized mouse who's, we've basically thinned 
the skull so that we can expose the surface of the olfactory bulb to a fluorescence microscope. And you see this. This is you know, breathing, but heavily anesthetized mouse. So you see this little you know, bright spots. And these guys are actually the blood vessels, both in the dura and the surface of the brain. So they're sort of the dark ones, right? If you now take a resting picture and then give a two-second order puff. Let's say I take a particular aldehyde that, you know, acetaldehyde or something. You blow it for two seconds, and then you take a picture again. So remember, this fluorescent signal is coming from the synaptic termini of the olfactory axons. If they're firing, they're going to release transmitter, which is going to increase the fluorescence because the probe gets exposed to the outside. And it should be reversible because when the endocytosis occurs, the, the protein gets taken back up and the fluorescence go, goes away. And, and I wouldn't be showing this unless we saw something, that you can actually see very beautiful responses. So you, this is basically a difference image. I took one image, and we gave an order and took another image, and look at the difference between the two, essentially subtracting at the background, right? And you see that in, for this particular order, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, about 10 spots increase their fluorescence. So for just this one little chemical, at a not a very high concentration, right? Many, many of these glomeruli are, are lighting up. So now, of course, we can do, look at this, you know, for many, many different patterns and different orders. And here's actually 16 different orders. And the good thing is different orders evoke different patterns of activity. Because if every order does the same thing, we know something is wrong with the experiment, right? So we could basically see some orders, you know, evoke nothing in this dorsal. First of all, I have to say we're only looking at the dorsal part of the bulb. There's all the other part of the bulb that's hidden, which is invisible to a microscope. So we're hoping that the dorsal is representative of the rest of it, but who knows. So uh, the <clears throat> this, for example, this odor didn't get any response. This one, basically, everybody lit up on this. So what, now what can you ask? So the thing you can ask is, let's say, here is this odor which is eliciting a response only in this glomerulus, let's say. This one glomerulus which is being activated. Now let's say we raise this mouse, a different mouse, in the, in the, when the environment has uh, this odor you know, all the time. So in other words, this particular set of neurons are constantly being activated by the environment because we added that chemical to its cage, right? Will those synapses change in any way, right? For example, you could imagine if something is there all the time, of course you adapt to it, right? You go into a room, something smells funny, but after some time, it, it, you adapt to it. So the smells are, in fact, the best example is if you wear some perfume, of course, your neighbors are going to be annoyed by it, but you, of course, forget about it after a while because you desensitize to it, right? So you, your olfactory system really, um, you know, adapts very quickly. So if you keep this odor for a long time, will this set of synapses in somehow change its property so it not to sense this odor anymore? Because it's irrelevant. It's there all the time. We don't know the answer, but those are the kinds of experiments we would like to do. Another set of experiments which we're beginning to do is how quickly during development are these maps set? Because the newborn rodents particularly, olfaction is actually very critical. They don't see until about two weeks. They don't open their eyes until two weeks, M mice and rats anyway. So they smell a lot. They depend on odor to you know, find their mothers, to do the suckling in response and so on. So the odor um, olfactory experience is actually quite critical, perhaps for the survival in the wild. In the, in the lab, of course, you know, they survive under anything. So the question is what happens you know, during development not surprisingly, even though the olfactory behavior is present uh, all the way at rest, uh, at, um, at birth, the postnatally, the circuit actually changes dramatically. So here's one way of looking at it. This is a cross-section, of tissue section of mouse olfactory bulbs at various different ages indicated here. <clears throat> you can see v just simply the size changes, right? So these are these glomeruli. They are much, much bigger than at birth. At birth, you, know, you can hardly see anything. Same thing, this is the region of the neural pill, if you will, the neural structure, where there's a huge number of synapses being made. And that structure you know, explodes in the first few weeks of development. So even though at birth these mice may be capable of smelling, the idea is that they may be capable of smelling simple things, but complicated discrimination, like rooting out a little bit of Swiss cheese or something, maybe requires uh, you know, more circuit development and that allows information processing. But the question is like what, we can ask a simple question, all of that is theory, we can ask a simple question. At birth or close to birth, what do these order book maps look like? I mean like I showed you these things where a given order and activates all of these different glomeruli, is this very different in the, in the young animals? And so we begin to look at that and so here is, 
a six-day-old mouse, which is actually the student who did this experiment is very, very good. It's pretty challenging. These guys, the mice are maybe about this big. So to do very detailed surgery in them, expose them, keep them alive, and do the microscopy for several hours, all anesthetized, of course, is, is not very uh, easy. So in this case, we find that even in a 60-year-old mouse, when you give a battery of odors, there actually is quite a lot of responses. The individual glomeruli are very small, because physically that's what they're, they're small. Like I just showed you the tissue section, they're actually quite small. But this sort of response localized activation is already there. What else could we have found? We could have found, for example, that all of these axons haven't really found the right place yet. Right? They're going there, they're going to, going to eventually get there in the right place. Right now, they're all a mishmash. So everybody goes everywhere, at least there's a lot of mixing. So you could imagine a given order activates many, many more of these spots because things haven't just really converged to the proper map. And over time, they become more and more precise. And so far, we haven't actually found evidence for that. It looks as if, even though everything is growing, at birth, there's actually a surprising amount of sort of precise mapping of these guys uh, into the thing. But of course, there may be more subtle things which you know, we, we haven't even maybe thought of, and you know, that's, that's something. But of course, then we can ask, from here to the adults, so I actually should show it. So here's a comparison of the young mouse within this adult, more adult-like mouse. It's actually not quite adult. It's about P30, which is not quite adult, <clears throat> postnatal 30 days. So for the same order, young, very young, and uh, I should say neonatal, and then older, you can see that there's some general, like this odor didn't evoke many responses in the young one, and it didn't in the older one either. This one is a little bit of an outlier. Here is more and more. So we have to do, of course, a statistical comparison of all this across many animals and in many order. But our feeling so far qualitatively is that there is perhaps some change from here to here. We have to find out what exactly that is. is the number of glomeruli activated, the intensity of the activation, and so on. But the surprising thing is really that even at birth, there is. But whatever it is, the future idea, the, the idea for future experiments is that we want to look at the normal development of these things. And then if you give it different odor experience, either enriched environment, or you can deprive odor experience uh, you know, from very early on, do you actually see changes in the way this, in the very first synapses? they're made and they're, how they function. So this is, of course, seems very far from learning and memory, right? But we want to just start with some simple sensory system where you can perturb the, the external world in a, in a sort of a reasonable way, an understandable way, I should say, to the animal and see how that changes the synaptic circuitry. And then, you know, hopefully that'll inform more complicated things. So <clears throat> I should stop and um, I should thank, I mean, the, the, by now, I think I'm uh, relying, this is one of the unfortunate things about science. Um, the, the older you get, it seems to find less time to be in the lab. Some people manage to do it, but I have um, you know, many students and postdocs who do a lot of wonderful experiments, and I don't get to spend as much time as I would like in the lab. And then we depend, of course, on support, uh, both federal funding, which, of course, we, we complain about it a lot, but, of course, we're very grateful because, you know, it's basically taxpayers thinking that, you know, here's something important, take some money, and it's, it's a privilege, really. So we, we, we get supported from them. And uh, thank you very much for listening. Thank you.